The Street Hotel was the Black-owned hotel down on the corner of 18th and Vine here in the historic 18th and Vine Jazz District. And you have to understand that 18th and Vine was a cultural crossroads where baseball and jazz intersected. So anybody who was anybody made their way to historic 18th and Vine, particularly from that jazz world. All the greatest jazz artists played and stayed here in this very area. So the sitting room kind of represents a part of that culture that was so greatly impacted by the Negro Leagues. But you could walk into the sitting room on any given day. And I'm gonna see if I can take you guys around so you can see a little bit of what's behind me. You could walk into the sitting room on any given day and you might see former heavyweight boxing champion, Joe Lewis, sitting in one of these chairs. Or at that time, the fastest man in the world, Jesse Owens. But check this out. That is the great orchestra leader, Lionel Hampton. Lionel Hampton was a devout Kansas City Monarch fan. So much so that my dear friend, Buck O'Neill, would put Hamp in a Monarch uniform. He would sit on the bench and serve as an honorary coach. As a matter of fact, that's Hamp right there again, surrounded by members of the Kansas City Monarchs. That is the beautiful Lena Horn shown throwing out the first pitch at a game. The legendary Cav Calloway had his own semi-pro black baseball team. So did Louis Armstrong. I don't know if you can see that or not, but Louis Armstrong also had his own semi-pro team. As a matter of fact, Satchmo's first love was baseball. He wanted to be a baseball player. Now, he just happened to be a better trumpeter. Uh-huh. So he chose the right path. And one of my favorite stories of many wonderful stories and memories that I've had here at this museum, I had the esteemed honor of walking the late, great General Colin Powell through the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And you have to understand, he is the general. There was a stature about him. You could almost say an air of regalness with the way that he carried himself. You knew you were in the presence of someone special until we got to the photograph of Louis Armstrong and his semi-pro Armstrong Secret Nine baseball team. And then he wasn't the general anymore. He had been reduced to a kid. And he looks at me and he says, my daddy played for Louis Armstrong semi-pro team. It gave me chills then. It gives me chills every time I tell that story. The Armstrong Secret Nine, based out of New Orleans, as they would say. So interestingly enough, all the jazz musicians wanted to be baseball players. All the baseball players wanted to be jazz musicians. So it was only fitting that they would come together here at 18th and Vine, where you had the best of both worlds, jazz and baseball radiating from this one street corner. My friend Buck O'Neill tells a, a wonderful story. He says that the Monarchs had played a game on a Saturday afternoon here in Kansas City. And they were all going to go home and get cleaned up. And they were gonna meet at a nightclub called the Subway. Well, it was called the Subway because the club was actually beneath street level. And as Buck would say, they are all sitting around the tables, sipping on a little tea. When in walks a kid, he's got a horn over his shoulder and he wants to blow. And everybody says, let him blow. Well, Buck says the kid gets up on the stage and he starts making some noises out of this horn that they never heard before, but you had to pay attention. That kid was 17 year old, Charlie Yardbird Parker the bird. Yeah, and, and that's an example of the kind of star power that Negro Leagues baseball attracted. Uh, as I always say, and I'll say it again, all the jazz musicians wanted to be baseball players. All the baseball players wanted to be jazz musicians. And you know what? 
it hadn't changed. No, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Because all the rappers want to play and, and all the players want to rap. So there's always been this mutual admiration and appreciation for what the others have did. And what you would oftentimes find is that by day, the jazz artists would come and watch these guys do their thing. And by night, the ball players would go to those clubs and watch the jazz artists do their thing. So it created a very close knit bonded group, baseball and jazz. And that's an important part of the story that we share here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And that was part of the impetus for our annual jazz and Jackie celebration because it, it was too pronged for us. We wanted people to understand that Jackie's professional baseball roots began in the Negro Leagues. I think a lot of times and a lot of people think that Jackie just walked out of nowhere and started playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. But his real rookie season was here in Kansas City in 1945. And while he was only here for five months, the five months he, he was here, he fell in love with everything Kansas City is famous for. Barbecue and jazz. He liked the ribs at a place called Old Kentucky Barbecue. For those of you who are fans of Kansas City Barbecue, Old Kentucky Barbecue would become the forerunner of the Great Gates barbecue chain of restaurants that are world renowned here in Kansas City to this day. And I'm going to say he fell deeper in love with jazz because I do believe that he was already a jazz aficionado. But as I remind folks, while New Orleans may lay claim to jazz, Kansas City gave jazz its soap. And so he was in the perfect place to celebrate both baseball and jazz. And he plays his first game with the Kansas City Monarchs on May 6th of 1945. And so our annual jazz and Jackie celebration really kind of pulls together the connection that he had to the great city of Kansas City and serves as a reminder that it was indeed the Negro Leagues and the city of Kansas City that gave America arguably its greatest hero in Jackie Robinson.